This morning's story is a story. How many of you knew this story before you heard it this morning? David and Bathsheba, right? David, David is now king over Israel. We went from where we were in the Exodus to the giving of the Ten Commandments to now jumping to David, who's king over Israel and could have anything you want. God said there in chapter 12 to him, he said, anything, I gave you everything. I gave you the, the former king's house. I gave you the former king's wives. I gave you the former king's lands. I gave you all of Judah. I gave you all of Israel. And anything else you would have wanted, all you had to do was ask. And I would have given it to you. David was a bright shining star in the history of Israel. And David is held up as one of our pillars of faith, right? If I could only have the faith of David, the David who wrote Psalm 51 that we sing on, uh, during Lent, create in me a clean heart, O God, and do not take your spirit away from me, right? This is David, the one who had this great faith. And this morning we see David at his lowest, right? It's the spring, and the kings are going out to wage war. So David sends his armies out, but David stays back in Jerusalem, and he's out on the roof looking down on his, on his kingdom, and he sees Bathsheba. So he sends to find out who she is, brings her to the castle, or the house. Things happen. She goes back home, she sends a letter that she's pregnant. When we skip some stuff here, right, because it, then we go to, she found out that her husband was dead. And there's some important stuff that happens in the middle here. If you don't know this story, you've got to know this, right? So when David finds out that Bathsheba is pregnant, she calls to the, back to his, to his general and says, send Uriah home. He's got to come home for a break. So he brings Uriah home. Uriah comes to meet with David. They talk about the battle and what's happening. And David tells Uriah, go home and spend time with your wife. Why does he want him to go home? We're not going to get into that, but most of you know why David wants him to go home to spend time with Bathsheba. Uriah doesn't go home. He, he lays down at the gate, of, the temp, at the gate of, King, of David's house, and he stays there. So he gets sent back to battle, and then David calls his generals again and say, Go to the, put Uriah at the point where all of the, the strongest men from our opponents are going to be. And then once he's up there, back everybody else up. So what's going to happen? Uriah's going to die. And who killed him? David did. David did. David, the, the star of, of what is going to happen here, the, the bright shining point in Israel's history, the person that God looks upon with favor and would give anything to is the man who stands out on the roof of his house and sees somebody and thinks, oh, I'm the king, I can have whatever I want. And he does it. And then when he tries to cover up his mess, and it doesn't work, he has to do something even greater to cover up his mess. And not only was Uriah killed, but Uriah and all of the people under Uriah was killed. And then, after she gets to mourn, he brings her into his house and becomes her husband. Why is this story even in here? And why is this one of my most beloved um, veggie tale stories? <laughs> How many of you know what veggie tales are? Right? Veggie tales is a is a cartoon of vegetables that tell Bible stories to little kids. And one of the best ones they ever did was the story of David and Bathsheba. Y'all know the story, right? Is that a children's story? No, not anywhere close to being a children's story. But, but it is, right? I didn't bring my ducky in. If any of you have seen my car, I've got a little rubber ducky on the, on the dashboard of my car inside. But the, the David and Bathsheba story in, in Veggie Tales is King George and the Ducky. 
Because King George is out on his roof, and King George is a, is a collector of ducks, right? He has all of these rubber ducks. He has the most profound rubber ducks in all of the kingdom, and he's got cabinets and cabinets full of ducks. But he's out on his roof one morning, and he notices in the bathtub of someone bathing this duck. And he says to his servants, I have to have that duck. So he gets that duck. Bless you. And then Nathan comes, right? Chapter 12. This is the best parable ever told in all the Bible. You thought Jesus could tell good stories. Nathan the prophet is one of the best storytellers there ever was. Because Nathan brings out, and in Veggie Tales, this is the reason I think I like this so much, is bring out a flannel board. How many of you remember what a flannel board is? Right? It's a piece of material, right? You could stick other things to it and make your story as you go along. So Nathan brings out a flannel board and he puts up the, the, the poor man and the rich man and all of the flocks on the rich man's side and the one little lamb on the, on the poor man's side. And he tells this story about how there was this man who had all of this stuff and he had everything that he could possibly afford and he could get anything that he would ever want. And then there was this other man who all he had in his life was this one little you, this one little lamb who he, who he kept as his own daughter. Right? This was part of the family. This was not something that they were going to eat. It was not something that they were going to... They used it probably for the wool. And it was a member of the family. And when somebody came to visit the rich man, the rich man said, I can't possibly kill one of my flock, so I'll just take this guy's because he's on my land and he's under me. Right? And what does David do? David gets upset. Because David knows in this story that that rich man is wrong. That there's nobody that should be taking something from somebody else when it doesn't belong to them. Right? It's like, it's so easy to see. But he can't see it in himself. Because then Nathan takes and turns the mirror on David and says, Guess what, king? It's you. We're so much quicker to point out somebody else's fault or somebody else's wrong rather than to see what's going on in our lives and to try to make ourselves better in line with God. We're so, it's, so easier, it's so much easier for us to look at somebody else's life and to say to them what's going wrong in their life than to take the time to figure out what's going on in ours. And the majority of the time when you see something wrong with somebody else, it's probably because it's something that you have wrong with yourself in some fashion or form. Maybe not the exact same thing that you see in somebody else, but in some way, shape, or form, something's going on in your life that's making you see that in other people. It's real easy for us to see somebody else messing up. It's not so easy for us to admit our own faults. And that's why this one story is in the Bible, right? David breaks the commandment of... Confirmation, kids? Those who are about to get confirmed? You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. And she's not even one of the six that's going to be confirmed next week. <laughs> and that one sin, right? Thou shalt not covet. And in our day and age, it's kind of hard for us to think about that because when I see something that somebody has that I, that I really want, I go and buy it. Right? If I really want it, I'll go and buy it because things are mass produced now. Right? If I, if I see a phone that you have that I really want to have it, well, maybe I'll wait till my contract's up, but, I mean, you know, <laughs> at some point I can go out there and get it. But in, in this day and age, in David's day and age, if you looked on somebody's cloak or somebody's oxen, those things were, they weren't mass produced. Those were unique, one of a kind things. You weren't supposed to covet somebody else's stuff. And this coveting of, of Uriah's wife leads to other sins. What does it lead to? It leads to the coveting, the wanting, leads to... Adultery, murder, and murder not just of Uriah, but of other people. And who is David actually sinning against? Who does David sin against? It's right here in chapter 12. I anointed you king, I rescued you, I gave you all this stuff, and anything else you would have asked, I would have given you that much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite by the sword, and has taken his wife to, to be your wife, and you have killed him with the sword by the Amorites, of the Amorites. 
In chapter 12, verse 10, the, the verse that we didn't get here at the end. But now the short shall never depart from your house, for you have despised me. Not only did he sin against himself, David. Not only did he sin against Bathsheba. Not only did he sin against Uriah. He committed sins against God. God would have given him whatever he wanted. Just as God will do that for us. Well, maybe not what we want. I would want to win the lottery, and then I would give 10% to the church. That wasn't a joke either. <laughs> God will give us what we need if we only follow after him and do what King David does in Psalm 51, where we get the big eraser, right? Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and do not remove your spirit from me. None of us are perfect and none of us are ever going to go through life without making mistakes. I've made them. My wife's not here to witness this, so somebody has to tell her I said this. <laughs> yeah, I know you, but we've all made mistakes. The answer to that is to confessing them and saying that you're wrong and asking for forgiveness. And then moving forward in that. Because you see what happens after this is, is Bathsheba bears the son. And what happens to the son? The son, is, the son dies. Because God cursed David because of this. But then David had another son with Bathsheba. Who was Solomon. One of the wisest rulers to ever rule. You see, there's always things that happen because of the mistakes that we made. The decisions that we make have consequences. But God loves us enough to never leave us or forsake us. To pick us up from where we were. To bring us forward. To forgive us of our past. And to bring us into the future that he has planned for us. Because that's what God is always going to do. So let go of your sins. Ask for forgiveness. And then walk proudly with God into the future that he has planned for you. Because that's where he's going to take you. And he's always going to be.